The case of Cassie Jo Stoddart. On September 22, 2006, a tragic incident occurred in Bannock County, Idaho, where 16-year-old Cassie Jo Stoddart lost her life. Cassie Jo was brutally murdered by two of her high school peers, Brian Lee Draper and Tori Michael Adamchik, while she was house-sitting. Her compassionate and trusting nature made her a vulnerable target for these two individuals, who were driven by a sinister desire for their first act of violence. This is the heart-wrenching story of Cassie Jo Stoddart, a 16-year-old girl who met a gruesome end, falling victim to a brutal stabbing perpetrated by her classmates, Brian Lee Draper and Tori Michael Adamchik. Welcome back to Crime Case Files. Before we begin, we extend our heartfelt condolences to Cassie Jo Stoddart's friends and family. We sincerely hope that such tragic events will never happen again in the future. On September 22, 2006, when Cassie woke up early in the morning, she knew that a significant day lay ahead. Her post-school agenda included heading to her uncle's house for a weekend of house-sitting and taking care of their dogs and cats. While the prospect of taking on adult responsibilities felt a bit overwhelming, Cassie was determined to excel at the task. Despite her parents' confidence in her abilities, they had agreed to let her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, accompany her for a few hours until she settled in. At 5.30 in the evening, Cassie's mother, Anna, dropped the two of them off at the house located in the Whispering Cliffs neighborhood of Bocatello. Their plan was for Anna to return and pick up Cassie on Sunday, coinciding with her Uncle Frank and his family's return from their weekend trip. It was approximately 9.30 p.m. when Anna, Cassie's mother, felt a surge of curiosity about how her daughter was faring. They had shared a close bond, and Anna often liked to check in on her, especially when Cassie was away from home. So, she decided to make that routine phone call to see how the evening was progressing. Anna's anxiety quickly transformed into relief when she heard Cassie's voice on the other end of the line. Cassie informed her that she and Matt were engrossed in watching a movie, and all appeared to be just fine. Her daughter's tone was calm and casual, giving no inkling that anything might be amiss or unsettling in any way. In that moment, Anna felt reassured and content, confident that her daughter was in good company and safe. Little did Anna know that as she hung up the phone, it marked the final conversation she would ever have with her daughter. On Saturday, both Anna and Matt made numerous attempts to reach Cassie by phone throughout the day, but their efforts proved futile. They assumed that perhaps Cassie was fully engaged in caring for the animals and would return their calls when she had a moment to spare. Little did they know, they were clinging to the hope of a luxury that had tragically slipped away. The real-life nightmare unfolded when Cassie's family returned home on Sunday afternoon. Frank, Cassie's uncle, had his 13-year-old stepdaughter enter the house, unwittingly becoming the bearer of an unimaginable horror. In the living room, the young girl stumbled upon the lifeless body of her cousin, Cassie, shrouded in a chilling pool of blood. Her piercing screams reverberated through the house, jolting her parents to the horrifying discovery. Responding to a frantic 911 call placed from the residence, law enforcement swiftly arrived on the scene, launching an immediate investigation. Despite the absence of the murder weapon, the grim reality was undeniable. Cassie had been mercilessly stabbed multiple times. The tranquil setting of house sitting had transformed into a harrowing crime scene. The grim details would later be revealed by the medical examiner, who conducted a harrowing examination of Cassie's body. The examination uncovered that she had suffered over 30 penetrating wounds. Perhaps even more chilling was the discovery that Cassie was missing a finger, leading to the unsettling speculation that this appendage had been severed during her desperate attempt to shield herself from the relentless onslaught of blows. The area where Cassie's lifeless body was discovered bore unmistakable signs of a fierce struggle. It was evident that she had fought valiantly, displaying incredible courage in her battle for survival. However, her assailants possessed both weapons and the element of surprise, ultimately overwhelming her. 
The investigation took a significant turn when detectives learned that Matt had been with Cassie on that fateful Friday night. Hastening to Matt's parents' house, they sought to speak with him. Matt cooperated and shared information willingly, but his seemingly nonchalant reaction upon hearing the horrific news of his girlfriend's brutal murder raised more than a few eyebrows, casting a shadow of suspicion over the unfolding tragedy. When questioned about the events of the last evening he had spent with Cassie, Matt provided a detailed account of her final hours. He meticulously recounted their time together, confirming that Cassie's mother had dropped them off at 5.30 in the evening. After their arrival, they indulged in some snacks before settling onto the couch to watch a movie, seeking to unwind and enjoy the evening. Around 9.30, an unexpected disruption occurred as the power suddenly went out. However, it quickly returned, leading both of them to dismiss it as a momentary glitch, something inconsequential. But to their surprise, moments later, the darkness descended once more. Matt vividly remembered the unsettling feeling that enveloped them, as the repeated power outages not only unnerved them, but also had a similar effect on the family dogs intensifying the eerie atmosphere that had begun to take hold. Matt recalled a particularly unsettling detail from that evening. One of the family dogs fixated on the basement stairs, incessantly barking and growling at seemingly nothing. Despite being aware that the fuse box was located downstairs, neither Matt nor Cassie dared to open the door, gripped by the fear of what might lurk on the other side. Feeling increasingly uneasy about the situation, Matt decided to call his mother, hoping to obtain permission for him to stay the night with Cassie to provide her with some much-needed comfort. However, his mother declined his request and instead suggested that Cassie spend the night at their house. Cassie, ever responsible and dedicated to her duties, declined the offer, expressing her commitment to caring for the pets and the house entrusted to her. As the clock neared 11 o'clock, Matt's ride arrived and he reluctantly left Cassie behind to face the uncertainty of the ongoing power outages alone. It was a decision that would haunt him in the days to come, leaving his anxious girlfriend to grapple with the eerie darkness and her mounting unease. Haunted by the eerie events that had unfolded in the house on Whispering Cliffs, Matt couldn't shake his unease. At half past midnight, he had made an anxious phone call to Cassie, desperately hoping for reassurance. However, there was no answer. He tried again in the morning, but the result remained unchanged. Silence on the other end of the line. Struggling to keep his mind occupied and growing increasingly concerned, Matt sought solace in the company of their mutual friend, Tori Adamchik. When Matt mentioned Tori Adamchik's name, it triggered a significant revelation. He suddenly recalled that he, along with another schoolmate, Brian Draper, had made an unexpected visit to Cassie's house on Friday night. Detectives were somewhat surprised that this crucial piece of information hadn't been mentioned earlier, but they were eager to learn more about this unplanned visit. According to Matt's recollection, Brian and Tori had arrived at around 8.20 and departed at approximately 9.30, claiming they were heading into town to catch a movie at the local theater. Before leaving, they had taken a casual tour of the house a gesture that didn't strike Matt as unusual at the time. Around 11.30 p.m., when Matt's mother arrived to pick him up, leaving Cassie Joe's daughter alone at the house. During his journey home, Matt dialed at Amchick's cell phone, inquiring about their whereabouts and hoping to potentially meet up with them later that night. However, when Adam Chick answered the call, he spoke in such a hushed tone that Matt could barely make out his words. Matt interpreted this as an indication that they might be at a movie theater. Since they had left before him, Matt hadn't connected them in any way to the horrifying events that unfolded with Cassie later that evening. In an effort to either eliminate Matt as a suspect or focus the investigation, detectives asked him to undergo a polygraph examination, a request he readily agreed to without hesitation. After the test revealed no signs of deception in his responses, Matt was cleared of any involvement in Cassie's tragic murder, 
leaving investigators to delve deeper into the perplexing circumstances surrounding her death. With Matt now cleared of suspicion, investigators shifted their focus squarely onto Brian and Tori, the only individuals known to have been at the house that fateful night alongside Cassie. When attempts were made to reach out to Tori Adamchik, detectives encountered an impenetrable barrier. It became immediately evident that neither Tori nor his family had any interest in cooperating or engaging in discussions with law enforcement. Their reticence only deepened the mystery surrounding the events of that night. In stark contrast, Brian Draper displayed a willingness to cooperate with the investigation. He readily agreed to come in for questioning, a step that would prove crucial in untangling the web of secrets and suspicions surrounding the tragic demise of Cassie. Brian readily acknowledged that he and Tori had visited Cassie's house on that fateful Friday night, vehemently asserting their innocence in her murder. He explained that they had spent some time there before heading to the movies, underscoring the simplicity of their activities that evening. However, during their initial conversation, the interviewer delved deeper by asking about the movie's plot they claimed to have watched. Brian, seemingly caught off guard by this unexpected question, struggled to provide an answer and drew a complete blank. Detectives decided to corroborate his alibi by speaking with the cinema's cashier, who had been on duty that Friday night. To their astonishment, she mentioned knowing Brian and Tori from school, but had no recollection of seeing either of them at the theater that evening. Doubts about Brian's veracity intensified, leading investigators to summon him for a second interview. When confronted with the undeniable fact that his alibi had crumbled, Brian, visibly uneasy, finally relented. He confessed that after leaving Cassie's house on Whispering Cliffs, he and Tori had spent several hours breaking into unlocked cars. Detectives sensed that there was more to the story than Brian was initially revealing and requested his return the next day for a polygraph test. When Brian showed up for the polygraph, he unexpectedly burst into tears and expressed a desire to cooperate fully with investigators. In the deeply distressing moments that followed, a weeping Brian, accompanied by his father, admitted his involvement in Cassie's murder. He maintained that he and Tori had initially intended to frighten her, but their ill-conceived prank spiraled into a tragedy. According to his confession, the groundwork for their actions had been laid earlier that night when he surreptitiously entered the basement and unlocked the door, planning to sneak back in later. After informing others that they were going to watch a movie, the two boys returned, parked discreetly down the street, donned dark clothing, gloves, and masks. Brian and Tori then created disturbances in an attempt to lure Cassie into the basement, supposedly to scare her. However, when their ruse failed to work, they resorted to manipulating the power by switching it on and off in the hopes of coaxing Cassie downstairs. When she didn't take the bait, they had no choice but to confront her on the main floor. Brian possessed a dagger-style weapon, while Tori wielded a hunting-type knife. Brian's initial attempt to startle Cassie by opening and slamming a closet door while she was asleep on the couch was unsuccessful. Brian and Tori then launched a vicious attack stabbing her around 30 times, with 12 of those wounds proving fatal. Brian contended that as he entered the living room, he witnessed Tori descending upon Cassie with a knife. He pleaded with his friend to stop, but the situation had spiraled beyond control. Once the horrifying act was committed, the two fled the scene and disposed of the evidence in a remote area on the outskirts of town. After apprehending Brian, Detectives initiated a search for his accomplice, forcing Tori to face questioning. However, the much-anticipated interrogation yielded little progress. When questioned about the night of the murder, Tori simply echoed Brian's initial fabrication about car theft. It wasn't until he was informed of Brian's comprehensive confession that he invoked his right to an attorney, abruptly terminating the interview. Despite Tori's refusal to cooperate, Authorities possessed sufficient probable cause to place him under arrest. On September 27, just three days after Cassie's body was discovered, 
the two 16-year-olds were formally charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Recognizing that Tori was unlikely to provide any more information, detectives focused on building rapport with Brian. After some persuasive efforts, on September 29, he agreed to lead them to the location where they had concealed the evidence of their heinous actions. Approximately eight miles outside of Pocatello, on the desolate Black Rock Canyon Road, investigators stumbled upon chilling evidence exposing the sinister intent of the teenagers, cleverly concealed beneath a mound of dirt and debris. Within the disturbing cache, unearthed that fateful day lay a videotape, gloves, a fragmented note bearing the handwriting of Tori Adamchik, blood-stained clothing, and two knives, later confirmed to be tainted with Cassie's blood. Remarkably, the incendiary attempt to eradicate these tools of their gruesome deeds had failed, leaving them intact and damning. Raising suspicions that the videotape might harbor dark secrets, the perpetrators sought to obscure, detectives dispatched it to a forensic restoration lab, hoping skilled experts could unveil the enigmatic contents it held. As they anxiously awaited the results, their relentless pursuit of justice against the two 16-year-olds, who outwardly portrayed innocence but concealed malevolence, continued unabated. Both young men, as it would later transpire, lived as social outcasts on the fringes of their school's social circles. Yet within their sequestered lives, they maintained a small circle of friends, which included Cassie and Matt. In a familiar narrative of those on the outskirts of society, they sought inspiration from kindred spirits who shared their sense of alienation. In Brian's case, he idolized the infamous Columbine shooters, Eric Harris and Dylan Klobold, who perpetrated a devastating massacre in April of 1999, claiming the lives of a dozen fellow students and an instructor. Conversely, Tori harbored a profound fascination with slasher films, with a particular fixation on the 1996 movie Scream. This film portrayed two teenagers who transformed murder into a deadly game, concealing their identities behind masks as they ruthlessly slaughtered their friends and anyone unfortunate enough to cross their path, all before confronting their own grim fate. When the fully restored videotape was finally delivered, detectives settled in to watch its contents, and what unfolded before their eyes provided a bone-chilling glimpse into the psyche of Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik. The footage commenced with Brian surreptitiously filming Cassie as she went about her morning routine, innocently arranging her belongings in her locker on the last morning of her young life. Cordial exchanges between them transpired before Brian abruptly turned off the camera. Little did Cassie know that she had already been marked for a gruesome and unthinkable fate, her impending murder. The tape then jumped ahead to around noon, revealing Brian and Tori seated in the school library chillingly crafting what they disturbingly referred to as a death list containing the names of individuals they coldly intended to target. Sinister smiles adorned their faces as they plotted the horrific slaughter of their friends, and they even discussed the nightmarish possibility of a school shooting as the horrifying crescendo of their diabolical plans. Before concluding the recording, they explicitly singled out Cassie as their initial and intended victim. Brian briefly expressed a flicker of remorse for what lay ahead, but he callously clarified that once they had determined she would be alone and vulnerable later that night, her fate had been irrevocably sealed. In subsequent footage captured during their aimless drives, the pair unabashedly reveled in their actions, laughing heartlessly and openly discussing their perverted pleasure derived from taking lives. They even disturbingly referred to themselves as sick psychopaths, while they may not have always recognized the truth about themselves, on this occasion, their self-assessment was hauntingly accurate. At precisely 11.30 p.m., immediately after committing their heinous act, they activated the camera one final time that fateful night. Driven by an adrenaline-fueled rush, they eagerly announced with a sickening excitement that they had just ended Cassie's life. Their words carried a chilling weight, leaving no room for doubt. In their initial surge of adrenaline-driven fervor, it was as though they wanted anyone who might view the recording to fully comprehend that they were the architects of their classmate and friend's demise. Now, 
Having observed the pair's actions and heard their bone-chilling declarations, detectives harbored no uncertainty regarding both suspects' active participation in Cassie's murder. Despite overwhelming evidence of his involvement, Tori adamantly clung to his assertion that he played no role in the tragic events of that night. On April 17, 2007, Brian Draper was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. He received a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the murder charge and an additional 30 years to life for conspiracy. Four months later, on August 21, Tori Adamchik faced the same convictions and sentences. However, the appeals process commenced almost immediately. After extensive legal maneuvering, Tori's complicity conviction was overturned on a technicality related to improper jury instructions. Nonetheless, he remains incarcerated, and the pursuit of justice endures. In the shadow of Cassie Jo Stoddart's tragic death, this chilling true crime story stands as a stark warning. It reminds us that darkness can emerge even among those we least expect. Although Cassie's life was cut short, her memory lives on as a symbol of tenacity and the fight for justice. Her tale exhorts us to maintain our vigilance, cherish our loved ones, and unite in opposition to the evil that poses a threat to our life. In her memory, we commit to a world where innocence is protected, compassion conquers cruelty, and justice is unwaveringly pursued.